All righty. Welcome to another episode of Furthering Christendom. Unfortunately, Mike can't be with me today, uh, but uh, we still have a wonderful guest here today. So it's not just me. You're not going to be bored just just listening to me rant on something. I'll try to talk very uh, minimal. But uh, yeah, so Dr. Thomas Bogardis from uh, the University of Pepperdine in California is with us today. And we're going to be talking about the philosophy of gender. So hopefully everyone will find this uh, helpful discussion. And uh, yeah, welcome to the show, Thomas. Um, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. What got you interested in kind of thinking about gender, thinking about the philosophy of gender, uh, metaphysics of gender? What, what sort of led you on this path, if you don't mind me asking? No problem. Yeah, I think it was about um, five years ago, sometime around 2015 or 2016. Um, and I think it, um, I was just noticing like people in the news and um, Jordan Peterson comes to mind. That's the one person I can remember who was um, getting, you know, censured and punished for saying things that I felt like, you know, perhaps I would say. <laughs> um, and so it sort of reminds me of uh, in the discourse on the method, Rene Descartes relates how he had finished an important treatise outlining all his views on nature and philosophy. And he was about to print it um, when he said someone whom he really respected, I'm pretty sure it was Galileo, was censured for his opinion on heliocentrism, um, or maybe more accurately, the sort of combative and insulting way that Galileo defended it in that dialogue concerning two chief world systems. Anyway, Descartes observed that Galileo was punished and Descartes said, I will not say that I agreed with this opinion, but only that before their censure, I observed nothing in it which I could imagine to be prejudicial, prejudicial either to religion or to the state, and consequently, which could have prevented me from giving expression to it in writing, if reason had persuaded me to do so. Um, so I was reminded of that when I was reflecting on this question, because that's how I felt watching these other people um, get punished for saying things about men and women and males and females that I thought, Oh man, that's something I may well say, I may well have said, had reason persuaded me to do so. So whereas Descartes sort of tucked his treatise away for a few years um, out of fear of the authorities, I thought I should at least read up on this topic and figure out what's going on um, so that I better understand it and clarify my own views. And then I ended up thinking, like after doing that research, I thought, you know, I'd like to um, relate some of the things that I found or mm -hmm. add something to the conversation. So that's how it got started around 2016. Awesome. Okay. Uh, and your work. So I was going through some of it last night, and you know, you, you lay out the traditional view of gender, or what you call the traditional view of gender, um, and you lay out uh, the sort of what you call the revisionist view of gender. Um, can you just kind of simply explicate what what you have in mind here, just so our audience will understand where yeah. you're coming from? Yeah. Well, um, I'm not. I'm not sure if I put it in terms of the traditional view of gender, because I think that gender, that word, is actually a technical term introduced um, by psychologists and uh, philosophers in the mid 20th century, or rather imported from linguistics and grammar. Um, your viewers have maybe encountered it if they studied a foreign language, especially languages that are gendered. Um, so maybe nouns come in two or more varieties, masculine and feminine. Um, and same thing with pronouns. Um, so anyway, we were using that term, humans were using that term gender in the study of grammar, um, in linguistics. And, and then some psychologists in the mid 20th century decided to import it and start using it to describe not you know nouns and verbs and pronouns, but um, actual masculinity and actual femininity. So things having to do with real people. Um, and at first, it seemed like that term gender was just the genus and the two species were masculinity and femininity. So masculinity and femininity were both kinds of gender. Before we brought in that word gender, we didn't have a genus term. Um, so it's useful in that respect. So sometimes when people use the word gender, um, they mean just masculinity and femininity. So the sort of stereotypical norms and expectations that we have of males and females. So insofar as there is like a traditional view of the word gender, 
that's probably what it is. Gender is the genus of these two species, masculinity and femininity. But for some reason, um, in the mid to late 20th century, um, philosophers and psychologists started speaking as though um, manhood and womanhood are themselves um, genders or gender terms, so that man is a gender term and woman is a gender term. Um, so I would say that's sort of, if there is a revisionary view of gender, that's the revisionary view of gender. But I would prefer to think in terms of just the words man and woman. And I would actually recommend to your viewers to avoid the word gender insofar as possible. <laughs> just as I recommend to my students, like, don't use the words objective or subjective when you're expressing your thoughts, because that, those words mean so many different things to so many different people. Um, try to say what you mean in other words. I would recommend the same thing with respect to gender. Um, whatever you're trying to say with that word gender, try to say it with other words because the term gender has become so um, confused and variously used that it's not really clear what it means anymore. So I would say just stick with words like man and woman. And the traditional use of the word man is the one that you'll find in dictionaries, including the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, and on these traditional uses of words like man and woman, to be a man is to be an adult human male. To be a woman is to be an adult human female. So these words, man and woman, are defined at least partly in terms of um, biological sex, male, maleness and femaleness. So I think that's the way the words um, have been used and still are used in many contexts around the world, um, at least in English. So I would say that's the traditional use of those words, man and woman. Um, there's lots of historical examples of people using the terms in these senses defined partly in terms of biology, um, including interestingly in the first wave of feminism. So during that period, during the first wave of feminism, there didn't really seem to be this kind of demarcation problem, like mm. what counts as a woman. Everybody sort of assumed that they knew what they were talking about, and it was pretty clear they were talking about the adult human females. Um, so even if even if you think about something like Sojourner Truth's 1851 essay, um, Ain't I a Woman? It's sort of like a seminal work in first wave feminism, Ain't I a Woman? Um, that speech centered on that rhetorical question, Ain't I a Woman? And... What made the speech so powerful is the answer was obvious. Like, yes, um, even an African-American woman like Sojourner Truth is a woman because to be a woman is just to be an adult human female. And clearly Sojourner Truth is an adult human female. Um, so yeah, that's the traditional use of words like man and woman. They're defined in terms of biology. And I'll just say one more thing in favor of this sort of thinking that this is the traditional view. Um, there's this other line of argument that I think is pretty good that goes something like this. Uh, look, we have terms for adult males and adult females and many other species that we come in contact with a lot. So like sheep and pigs and cows and deer and chickens and ducks, etc. <laughs> we have like words for the adult males, um, the mature males and the mature females, um, because we interact with these species a lot. And that is a distinction that's very um, important to us, so we introduce terms to track the difference. Um, and so it seems pretty plausible that we'd also have terms for adult males and adult females of our own species. And if you look across our language, man and woman are the best candidates. Um, so there's another uh, line of reasoning in favor of thinking that that's what man and woman have traditionally meant. That's why they were introduced. So um, that's the traditional use of man and woman. Um, when I say, when I speak of revisionary uses of these words, revisionary uses of these concepts, man and woman, um, it's just any use that denies these traditional definitions. So I'll just give you some examples. Um, Judith Butler famously put forward a view on which to be a woman is to repeatedly perform as a woman, um, to sort of regularly and for the most part behave in line with feminine gender norms. That's what it is to be a woman. Um, my understanding is that Butler has since then uh, changed her view, but that's the view that's sort of associated with Judith Butler. Uh, another prominent view was expressed by um, Eleanor Burkett 
uh, to be a woman is to have had certain kinds of experiences. Um, she says to have endured certain indignities, relished certain courtesies. Um, so things like being catcalled or having doors open for you, um, those sorts of experiences. You have to have enough of those um, in order to count as a woman. I'm not endorsing these views. I'm just reporting these views to you. So um, on that view, like biology doesn't matter. All that matters is your experiences. And similarly with Judith Butler, um, biology doesn't matter. All that matters is how you're um, repeatedly performing, how you're expressing yourself. Um, I'll just mention maybe a couple more that I think are important. So um, Sally Haslinger at MIT is known for defending a view um, that predates her. You can find it in Gail Rubin, for example, but it's a view on which to be a woman is to be um, systematically subordinated along some dimension, maybe economically subordinated or politically or socially, um, legally, because you are marked as a female. You're sort of taken to be a female. Um, you are observed to be a female or you're imagined to be a female. You're sort of suspected of being female. And then you're subordinated on that basis. That's what it is to be a woman. So although the word female shows up in this definition, you don't have to actually be female to be a woman on this definition. You just have to be like suspected of being a female. If you are presenting as a female and read as a female and then subordinated on that basis, you would be a woman on Heslinger's view. Um, I'll just mention one more. Um, I think... Your viewers, and, and, probably... and that's even if you don't want to be considered a woman, right? Yes, that's that's right. you. You could be identifying as male, thinking you're male, but others look at you, they see uh, feminine traits and so forth, and then they they they, um, yeah, uh, follow suit and and sort of make you um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, kind of subjugate you or something like that uh, because yeah. of the that appearance, right? And so then then you're still a female. Yeah, so just as um, Judith Butler has abandoned uh, the view that's most associated with her in favor of a um, um, a view that is meant to include um, trans individuals who identify as women, um, Sally Haslinger has done something similar. I think that Sally Haslinger no, no longer defends the view that I just attributed to her, although she's most well known for having defended that view. For this very reason, um, people like uh, philosopher Catherine Jenkins have pointed out that some trans individuals who identify as women may not count as women on Haslinger's definition um, because although perhaps they're present, this is just one example, um, they might be presenting as women, um, they may not be read as women or taken seriously as women. Um, they may be read as like males who are pretending or something. Um, and so if they're not being subordinated because they're observed or imagined to be female, they're not women on Haslinger's view. Um, so that's just one of the sort of examples that Catherine Jenkins but, gives. But it seems like a lot of the movement in the sort of LGBTQI um, circles has actually changed or altered, right? Um, a, a lot of the definitions that were originally given maybe 20, 30, 40 years back. Is that right? Am I understanding you right? Mm, yeah, yeah, 20 or 30 years. Yeah, I think so. Um, right now, I would say sort of orthodoxy in the philosophy of gender is, um, well, I can't give you a definition because no definition has been offered, but whatever a woman is, insofar as there are women, right, um, right. it's got to respect self-identification. Sure, so sure. if you identify as a woman, you're in. Um, if you identify as not a woman, you are not to be included in the category of women. And so there's actually one philosopher who um, seems to just straight up endorse this sort of self-identification view of womanhood. Um, Talia Mae Betcher, um, in a 2017 work, it looks like Betcher endorses a view on which being a woman is entirely a matter of sincere self-identification. Mm. So that is probably the view that your um, viewers are most familiar with, because that's the one that's kind of like gained right. currency at the grassroots level. Right. That's the one you sort of hear, to be a woman is to identify as a woman. Yeah. So these are all revisionary views, because I, or I call them revisionary views. Um, because they deny the sort of definition of woman and man that you would find in a biological link or, or whatnot in the Oxford English Dictionary. Yeah, where it's defined in terms of biology, not just biological sex, but also species, age, um, and yeah, maturity. So, what, I know you're not a fan of using the word gender, <laughs> but I do. I do wonder 
Um, what do you think of this sort of a broad account of, of gender, right? That gender is um, not, it's not separated from sex totally, but it is sort of a distinct category than sex. But nonetheless, it's still linked to sex because, you know, let's say that gender is something like um, sociological manifestations or so social manifestations of certain biological properties, sorry, some, some sort of account of gender like this. I was curious to get your, your thoughts of. Yeah, so um, I think that word certain there is pretty important. You said social manifestations of certain biological properties. Yeah, of course, right, we'd right. have to be clear on which right. biological properties. Right. Because, you know, many of our biological properties have social implications like our height and our weight and our skin color and our hair color and so on. But we wouldn't call those gender. Um, so when you say certain biological properties, I, I guess you mean something like those associated with biological sex. Sure, exactly. And then, yeah, yeah, there's the link between what you're calling, what you propose to call gender and sex. Gender is, as um, some philosophers have put it, the social meaning of sex. I mean, that's a, kind of a common definition one hears of gender. It's the social meaning of biological sex. Okay. Um, something like the norms and expectations that we associate with the two biological sexes, male and female. What does it mean to be male in our society? Mm -hmm. That's that's one kind of gender. I guess that's that's masculinity. I mean, we already kind of had a word for that. That's masculinity. <laughs> that's yeah. what it means to be male in our in our culture. What does it mean to be female? That's femininity. And masculinity and femininity are both defined in terms of biological sex. Masculinity is the sort of norms and expectations we have of males. And similarly with femininity. And so if that's um that's sort of as I said the original use of the word gender mm -hmm, mm -hmm. back in like the 50s and 60s if you see um, people like um, robert stoller and john money introducing this word gender into the literature um they seem to have in mind something like what we would now call gender roles mm -hmm. or gender expression or gender norms um and again it's what we would call masculinity and femininity and so if that's what you mean by gender, masculinity and femininity, then I would say, of course, there is a sex gender distinction. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to be male. It's something okay. else to be the norms and expectations that we have right. of males. Those exactly. are two things. Yeah. So, so, so your objection like, isn't so much that there's a distinction. It's just unhelpful given today's context. It's just better to, to stick with male and female. Is, is that right? Um, so my objection to like, or my, the reason why I recommend not using the word gender. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's just because people make, um, people sort of slide between, um, thinking of gender as masculinity and femininity. And this is kind of a natural slide. I was, I was thinking about this in preparing for our conversation. Um, I think maybe the, the sort of conflation or mistake that's being made is, People begin by thinking about gender as masculinity and femininity, which mm -hmm. I think is like not really objectionable. That's fine. Right. Those are those are real things for sure. But then they kind of slide from thinking about masculinity to thinking about manhood and saying like, well, masculinity, that just is manhood. And we kind of use manhood to refer to like the traits and features of men, like mm -hmm. how men are. But then you can easily make a move from thinking about that, like manhood as a property to manhood as like the state of being a man. <laughs> um, not just like the sort of typical features of men, but um, just what is it to be a man? Right. And so I think the slide kind of occurs, this is all kind of sketchy because I haven't thought about it too much, but the slide I think goes from like masculinity to manhood to man. And so then people, maybe that's why people started speaking as though man, that word is itself a gender term. Because, you know, gender is about masculinity. Masculinity mm -hmm. is about manhood. And man is how we express manhood. Um, but that, I think that's not quite right. And I think there's an important mistake that's being made. It's sort of like thinking, um, thinking that gold is just the same thing as like being golden, having all the features that we associate with gold. So being like, you know, lustrous and yellow and soft and so on. That's what it is to be gold. But that's not right. Those are just the superficial properties of gold. Gold To be gold is something else. It's to be atomic number 79. There's like an essence of gold. And then the way that gold manifests itself is something different. Um, or maybe a better example is water. 
So we have all these like superficial features that we associate with water, you know, being odorless and colorless and falling from the sky and filling lakes and rivers and so on. You can drink it, but that's not what it is to be water. Um, we, what we found out is the thing that has all those manifest properties is H2O. That's the essence of water. And so I think something similar should be said about um, manhood and womanhood. If you think about manhood as something like stereotypical features, right. um, that's different from the thing that has those stereotypical features. And at least the traditional view is the thing that has those stereotypical features of masculinity or manhood is and are the adult human males. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is to be a man that's like the essence of manhood um so anyway there's that was a little tangent but well no no uh, so what I, originally what i had in mind was something like you know you look at the biological makeup of a man right there's more testosterone and uh the man is built different right um so Typically. he's more aggressive he's uh stronger on average right faster on yeah. average Typically, you look at yeah. the 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 body of a woman and uh she obviously is able to procreate in ways that, that men aren't um and uh, we can see that sort of a special bond that the woman has with the child especially when the child is first born and so forth and we, we can sort of see design behind the see teleology and from this sort of come up with norms uh so men are supposed to protect the family and uh are supposed to provide for the family. Uh, women are supposed to um, uh, bear children. And, you know, uh, like I said, they, they, they're maybe their first role is to the children rather than to provide, at least ideally. Um, yeah, so I was, I was kind of thinking, like, if we understand gender uh, as distinct from, uh, from biology, from sex, uh, but nonetheless, we sort of see these these roles of gender determined by our biology. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was just kind of like this kind of whole idea. Anyway, I'm just kind of speaking yeah, as I go. Like you, were, but... you were describing some um, sort of traditional stereotypical gender right. norms. Um, and you were saying... Grounding them in biology. and You could see why at least people would arrive at these gender norms. By reflecting on biology or something like yeah. the way that males typically are and females typically are you can see why people would reach certain conclusions about how humans ought to behave um so so as an aristotelian thomas broad, at least broadly yeah. thomas i'm yeah. kind of deriving these these oughts from from our biology yeah um so i would just say that there's there it's a matter of some controversy <laughs> to put it mildly whether those gender norms are true. Like in the philosophy of gender, I, I described one kind of orthodoxy, um, which is like whatever <clears throat> women are, it better include trans individuals who identify as women. But there are some dissenters. Um, so for example, the gender critical feminists um, tend to think that they tend to endorse the biological definitions of woman and man, um, but they're gender critical which means they would be extremely skeptical of the sort of gender norms that you just described. They would right. say those might be um, widely accepted, but um, they're certainly not true and they should be abolished and people should right. be free to do whatever they want and so on. So I would just recommend that if you want to have, um, if you would like to choose an example that might be less contentious, um, based on my experiences on Twitter, what I found is like, um, Although gender critical feminists say, you know, um, they're very skeptical of gender norms, there might they might be open to some norms that are sort of, you know, sexed, some some norms that just apply to adult human females and other norms that apply to adult human males, if only in terms of hygiene. And we'll just sort of leave it at that. But um, just based norms based purely on your gotcha. biology, um, there might be some norms that apply to males and not females, and others that apply to females and not males just in terms of their biology. And then insofar as we think women just are the adult human females and men just are right. the adult human males, now we've got some norms about men and women. Um, and I guess they would not, they wouldn't be so keen to abolish those. They rather wish to abolish the sort of unjustified, what they view as unjustified oppressive gender norms. So right. that's my reflection on what you just said. If you wanted a 
less controversial okay. example. Just choose a kind of banal example having yeah. to do with hygiene or something. Hygiene. No, I, I, I got you there. It's just, it seems yeah. to me, so as, as someone who defends traditional gender norms that like the ones I've um, advocated uh, for or, or explained a few minutes ago, uh, it seems to me like really important though that 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 there are contemporary defenders of this in the literature, um, because if you think these are 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 good and true and so forth, um, and an important part of flourishing as a society and what it means to be a human person, then attacking these gender norms would be attacking our happiness, attacking yeah. attacking our our flourishing as as a society, yeah. and so it it seems to me. Um, well, well, I get what you're saying. You sort of like, well, minimally, maybe we can get them to agree to this. Yeah. <laughs> it seems, nonetheless, maybe we do that, but then argue for uh, what I what what I take to be the what the church has um, historically affirmed for you know two thousand years. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, here's, I mean, this is all this is this topic. I think is important, as you say. I say, um, I agree with you that it's very important and worth thinking about. It's always kind of been on the periphery of the sort of things that I'm. I'm thinking about in this area, but um, something I have noticed, I mean, <clears throat> here's, here's what I would like to do a deep dive into why people have such um, strong feelings that there like could not be any true gendered norms. So they're open to the idea that like, you know, there are moral norms about humans, you know, here's what, here's how humans ought to behave. But if you say, well, in addition, there are norms that apply only to men and other norms that apply only to women. There's a lot of resistance and it would be nice to sort of see why that is and take a deep dive into it. And of course, I'm sure part of it is the history of oppressive right. and incorrect gender norms, right. like foot binding and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that's a large part of it. Um, but I guess what I'm a little worried about is that there are, the sort of arguments one hears in conversation against the possibility of gendered norms are very similar to the kind of arguments that one hears against um, moral realism. And mm. it's typically like arguments from variation and disagreement, right. cross-cultural right. kind of variation, variation across time and across culture. And uh, I don't know, like those are the sorts of arguments, at least for me, that like yeah. one quickly dismisses in a conversation about moral relativism in philosophy 101. Um, and so I hope there's I hope there's more to the story than that, but I haven't yet looked into well, it. It's good stuff. Um, what about our intersex brothers and sisters? You know, they're oftentimes brought up to um, kind of disprove traditional views of gender, traditional views of um, uh maleness femaleness if you'd say um do you do you think that this poses a problem for sort of the traditionalist <clears throat> so I, I i can't see how and um in that paper i wrote called um evaluating arguments for the sex gender distinction um i do consider one statement of this kind of argument from a philosopher named jennifer saul and what saul says is um look man and woman, those words can't be um, sex terms. They can't just be referring to biological sex um, because if they did, then you would expect, she says, every adult human would be clearly a man or clearly a woman. She says that's like our folk notion of um, biological sex. Everybody falls neatly and easily into these two categories. And so if man and woman were basically just sex terms, everybody would fall neatly and easily into either the man category or the woman category. That's the first premise. <laughs> and then the sex, the second premise, according to Jennifer Saul, is um, there are some individuals, namely intersex individuals, who do not fall neatly and easily into either the man category or the woman category. That's what Jennifer Saul says, just reporting what Jennifer Saul says. And so the conclusion is, look, man and woman aren't sex terms. Um, and so by way of reply, what I point out is uh, this very same sort of argument would also show that male and female are not biological sex terms, which I think is absurd because male and female are sex terms if anything is. Um, and the reason is like, according to Jennifer Saul, our uh, folk conception of biological sex 
is that everybody falls neatly and easily into one of these two categories. And so if male and female are sex terms, then everybody should fall neatly and easily into either of these categories. But I think Jennifer Sell should admit that um, just as intersex individuals, according to her, don't fall neatly and easily into either the man or woman category, neither do they fall neatly and easily into the male and female categories. So this would equally be an argument against male and female being those terms being sex terms, which again, I say uh, is absurd. That couldn't be Sorry, just you in itself. Yeah. So um, what I think what's going on is Jennifer Saul is just mistaken to think that mm -hmm. our conception of biological sex is such that everybody falls neatly and easily into one of these two categories. That's just not true. I mean, um, I found a nice quote from Simone de Beauvoir, who's sort of like feminist superhero. Um, she says in her book, The Second Sex, um, in nature, nothing is perfectly clear. Mm. In nature, nothing is perfectly clear, which I think is completely, I think that's right, at least in biology and chemistry. Maybe at the level of fundamental physics, you get some <laughs> concepts yeah. that have no vagueness. Um, but certainly in biology, as far as I can tell, like every biological concept I can think of, including mm -hmm. the central biological concept of life, um, admits of borderline cases. There are things that aren't clearly alive or dead, like viruses um, and prions, these things like replicate, um, but they don't do other things that are characteristic of life. So they're sort of like borderline cases. Um, so anyway, biology is full of vagueness. It's full of um, concepts that admit of borderline cases. So why shouldn't male and female be the same? Also, um, if you spend time reflecting on just what it means to be a male and what it means to be a female, I think you'll realize, or at least I've realized that these terms are not mutually exclusive and neither are they exhaustive. So something, some organism could be both male and female. There's nothing in the definitions of male and female that rule that out. And in fact, there seem to be real life examples. Some flowering plants have both male parts and female parts. And so if you asked of that flowering plant, is it male or female? I think the right answer is both, <laughs> you know, it's both male and female. Um, and there are some organisms that don't reproduce sexually at all. Like a yeast, for example, just reproduces asexually by fission, by budding. And so if you ask of that organism, is it male or female? The correct answer is neither. So these definitions of male and female um, as I say, aren't mutually exclusive. Something could be both male and female, and they're not exhaustive. There's other options. So something could be neither male nor female, um, like a yeast. Um, and I think that's because, again, well, maybe I should just say what it is to be male and what it is to be female, and then you can kind of see um, how something could be both or something could be neither. And I, I don't mean to imply in any of this conversation that any intersex individuals are both male and female or neither male and female. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just reflecting on our concept of male and female and showing that Jennifer Saul is incorrect to think that um, everything falls neatly and easily into one of the categories or the other. Um, that's just not the case. Um, so here's what it is to be male. Uh, to be a male, it, it's something like this. I'm just kind of <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, here's what I got. It's to be a member of a subtype of a species that's sort of meant to or organized towards the production of small motile gametes. Or we'll, we'll just say spermatozoa um, and then leave it a little unclear what would count as a spermatozoa, spermatozoan. Um, but that's what it is to be male, to be a member of a subtype of a species whose body is meant to, has the function of producing um, sperm, spermatozoa. Now, notice that something can be meant to produce sperm, can be organized around the production of sperm, can have the function of producing sperm and not fulfill this function. That's, that's sort of a characteristic of function. Something can have, the, have a function but not be fulfilling it, maybe due to injury or damage or disease or something like that. So, you know, your kidneys have the function of um, filtering your blood and producing urine, but they may be failing at doing that. Right. And we call that kidney failure. Um, so just because like maybe very immature males 
or extremely mature males are no longer producing sperm or not yet producing sperm, or maybe somebody due to injury or disease is not producing sperm, that does not prevent them from being male. As they're long still as they're oriented male. toward yeah. it. Yeah. Oriented is another way to put it. Aimed at the production of sperm. They still have the design plan to use some plantigian terms. There we go. If you like speaking of design plan, um, <laughs> feel free to import that here. So yeah, I think that it's a teleological notion and some of my naturalist friends <laughs> uh, get a little bristly when you use the T word, teleology. Um, so I would recommend in these conversations, um, just speak of function. I was about to say, just use the F word, but no, don't do that. Speak of function. <laughs> um, because biologists love talking about structure and function. Right, right, right. And um, well, there, there are some enough. good naturalistic accounts. I, I don't think they actually work, but like yeah, Ruth yeah. Millikan, Peter Graham, you know, yeah. history uh, or natural selection sort of being involved, explaining teleology and, what, and whatnot. But I, I take your point. <laughs> uh, yeah. Probably in, in order to avoid trigger uh, triggering your friendly naturalist neighbor, might want yeah. to just use the word function. Yeah, just sp speak of functions. And so that's what it is to be male, to have, you have a body that has the function of producing sperm. Uh, eventually, or at one time, or something like that. Um, and then similarly with female, that's to have a body that's meant to, or organized around, or aimed at the production of large, typically um, immotile gametes, which we call eggs or ova. And so notice that like, um, like a flowering plant, an organism could be or oriented towards the production of both the um, male gametes and the female gametes. Um, in which case, I guess the plant kind of counts as both male and female. Or what we typically say is it has male parts and female parts. But if you asked of the plant itself, is it male or female? I guess the answer is both. And yeast, again, are not organized for just the production of either. So I guess we'd say neither male nor female. An interesting case is, I guess there's a lot of species of fish that um, mm. It's it's said that they change sex during the course of their lives. Um, so there's two ways to describe what's going on. One is like if you ask of this of a particular one of these fish, I guess a clownfish is one example. If you ask of a particular clownfish, is it male or female? The answer will change depending on the time that you ask it. <laughs> so like at this stage of life, it was male. It was producing sperm. Uh, but then, you know, a year later, it was female producing eggs. Um, so maybe the thing to say about like clownfish is never are they both male and female, but they do alternate during the course of their own lives. But um, I think another, uh, another thing you might say is actually for their whole lives, they're both male and female because, you know, mm -hmm. when they're born, they're sort they sort of, they have all the information they right, need. Right, right, right. And they are, they are designed to change sex during the course right. of their lives. So their bodies are organized towards the production, both of sperm and eggs, right. although not at the same time, but alternating. <laughs> and of course, you could be more oriented toward one particular function uh, th than the other. And that, that might play a role in reference to, to seeing uh, one as more primarily male or more primarily female. Yeah. So um, just returning back to the um, issue of intersex individuals, I think that in most case, most of the cases that we describe as intersex, um, it's actually clear when you reflect on the case that this is a case of a male who had um, a disorder of sexual development um, or a female who had a disorder of sexual development. And the impression I've gotten from speaking with some intersex individuals is many of them feel quite strongly that they are male or mm -hmm. female mm -hmm. um, and they don't wish to be in some other category of both or neither right right um, and i think that's i think that's the case for um most of these conditions that we describe as intersex um yeah so well, let, let me ask you one quick question and and then i'll be out of time here um one last question maybe in i don't know 90 seconds right and 90 seconds uh what do you say to the person who says, no, we can't get norms from biology, all right? We can't talk about norms when we talk about biology. So, so sex and, and gender, they're, they're not related. You know, gender is all about sociological norms, functions for how we should act with each other in society. Um, biology is, is merely, merely this sort of description. Um, we can't sort of derive this ought 
uh, we can't derive normativity from from biology. What what would you say to that person? Yeah, so um, I also deal with this sort of objection in the paper, evaluating arguments for the sex gender distinction. This sounds like an argument um, that I found from Robin Dembrov. Right. And the argument is something like, um, if it's relevant to the question of what a man is and what a woman is, then the argument is something like, um, the property of being a man has some normative implications, implications about how you should be or what you should do. Just we'll use a, a silly example, like if you're a man, you should drive a truck or something like that. Right. Um, and similarly with being a woman, that has normative implications, maybe something like you should wear pink or something like that. These are just silly examples. Sure. Um, so man and woman have these normative implications, but male and female do not. Um, our biological concepts are sort of um, normatively impotent. They don't have any normative implications. And so that shows that um, being a man couldn't just be defined in terms of biology, couldn't just be a, an adult human male, um, similarly with being a woman. And so in response, I would um, I would like to deny... Well, I would like to deny the first, oh, here's what I would say. Um, I think that when people have in mind these sort of normative implications, either they have in mind the ones that aren't real, like men should drive trucks and women right, should right, wear pink right. and stuff like that. Um, in which case it's false that being a man actually has those implications right. and being a woman actually has those implications. And likewise, it's false that being a male has the implications and being a female has those implications. So if you're thinking of the sort of silly implications that are false and oppressive and we should be critical of, right. then neither our biological concepts nor our gender concepts have those implications. Um, so that's fine for the traditional view because the traditional view says being a man just is being an adult human male. So if one has the implications, the other should too. If one doesn't have the implications, neither should the other. Okay, but if there really are true implications that follow from just being a man or being a woman, then I would say the same thing goes for being an adult human male and being an adult human female. So I would just deny that um, our biological concepts can't have normative implications. And in the paper, I give an example of, you know, if all you know about something is that he's an adult human male, that's all the information I give you, you are in a position to know, you can safely infer that you should not enslave this person, for example. Mm. So there's a normative implication <laughs> you get from just your biological concepts. Um, and I've seen people in reply kind of mumble things about David Hume and the is gap and mm. how mm. you can't derive prescriptions from descriptions. But what I would say to those people is like, what else do you need to know about this mm. adult human male before, you're, before you feel safe in saying that we shouldn't enslave him? What else do you need to know? Right. And I don't think you need to know anything else. <laughs> and and, um, and of but, course, if you're if you're a Thomist, right, or a broadly one at least, you're going to think all this teleology ultimately is grounded in God's God's mind and God's will, and you can sort of see that as interchangeable with God's commands. So, at least on uh, certain views of Thomas, you could sort of go this route. Um, at least that's that's the route sort of I prefer in order to avoid the the Isot gap. Okay. Um. Well, here's one other thing you can say in response to the kind of person giving this argument. Um, the first premise presupposes that we can cross the Azot gap because it says um, the way I'm understanding the argument so that it's relevant to yep. man and woman. Sure, sure. The first premise says that, you know, that property of being a man has normative implications. So mm -hmm. sentences like this is a man entail sentences like this person should not be enslaved. Right. So we're already crossing the Azot gap. If you think that you can move from descriptions of gender, descriptions about whether a person's a man or a woman, to prescriptions, why can't you do the same thing with descriptions of biological sex? Um, we're already crossing the Azot gap in premise one. Why can't we do it um, with respect to um, these biological concepts? So yeah, that's what I would say in reply. Um, yeah, that, and that's well, what hey, I and I appreciate that. your time, all the... Uh, the, the conversation we had, it went, it went a little longer than I expected. Sorry for that. <laughs> I just thought these were really interesting uh, things, uh, what, what you're talking about, interesting statements you're talking about. So. That's how philosophy goes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your time, and thank you very much for your work, and uh, maybe maybe have you on in the future. Sounds good. Thanks, Tyler.